for opening the discussion with the audience. Um, I would like to um, ask the panelists for a second round, but very brief, please, and to reflect to uh, less than five minutes, if it's possible, just to, um, to give the opportunity to you, if you want, to comment on the others, to uh, build bridges, or to outline differences and struggles, or if you prefer also to think about uh, um, uh, whatever your experience and work is compatible with the GROW message, we already have uh, some uh, uh, inputs from that during the presentation. And what do you think are the main challenges for the growth? So I would like to start now from uh, uh, in the opposite order. So I will give uh, immediately the word to Chiang again. <laughs> if it's okay. Or do you, do you want some time maybe? Okay, then let's give let's give the word to Michel, and then okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I actually may react to uh, to your presentation. Um, so I think it's extremely good news to know that objectively we can get there, but at the same time, it's a bit you know this critique that it is actually a technological uh, thinking. Because, of course, you can say, well, people should move to eating less meat, but all the pressures are going the other direction. Uh, we're getting more obese, we're getting more advertising for sugar and salt-rich uh, food. Um, you know, I, I used to work in a telecom business, and you probably know this, that in most European countries, there's fiber in the ground. Um, I, in Antwerp, where I used to live, there were like six different fiber uh, infrastructures uh, following the roads, following the railroads, and they were used like 0.009% of their capacity. And the simple reason is that in, a, in, a, in our capitalist system, there is zero interest from the telecom industry to make that available because that would destroy the commodity price of broadband. So it's very simple. We can do it, but we don't do it. And I think it's pretty much what will happen with zero carbon if we don't change uh, a lot of things in, in social and, and economic logics, yes, we can do it objectively, technocratically, but it's not going to happen because the, the mainstream and dominant interests are just aligned against doing this. And so then we're back into the difficult questions. Uh, but I, you know, I think, of course, it's really good to have this news uh, because that's a very hopeful news that if we wanted it and if we had the right kind of society, then indeed, maybe, you know, this would actually work. And I'm actually very surprised and very happy to hear it, uh, that this has been done. So thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you. So Alice? Yeah. Um, can I just make a brief response or should I? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I think there are big shortfalls to the, to the project. It, it, it is a proof of concept. Um, and, but I, I also have, so I find this, this conference really interesting and also learning about all of the other projects that are going on is, is really great because I, I have some doubts about my project and I actually enjoy more of the projects that, that sort of sit under the degrowth heading because of their community aspect. And I think people is, is missing from, people are missing from Zero Carbon Britain, right? And people are the most important thing. Um, so, so having a, a people-centric approach and hearing about projects that are on the ground is, is really important to me. Um, it's also interesting this this conference in general and this um, this topic because it's actually, although I'm I'm not from the degrowth sort of background, um, it's actually sort of the key to an argument that I've been having with my, a friend of mine for about four or five years, um, uh, and it, it's about. Uh, whether or not we can transition to a, a sustainable future without changing uh, societal systems. And, and the, the, the reason that we have this argument is that our question is about time. So time is of the essence when it comes to climate change, right? And I'm, I'm not gonna be like really scary, but we, you know, we, we need to sort this out in the next like 10, 15 years. Um, and it will become progressively harder. And we will need to adapt as well as deal with climate change in terms of mitigating it. So do we have time for changing all of these social systems? Is it possible to do it without changing the social systems? Is that quicker? 
is it not possible to do it without changing the social systems? And I think this this conference and it is sort of giving me an answer to that. And I, I'm really enjoying uh, hearing about uh, the degrowth movement. So, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Chang. Um, thank you for your very interesting presentation, and I do agree that it is um, uh, somehow it's not about time, but it's, it's about our willingness. Do we want to do that? And it's just about never be late if you not start now. Yeah. And uh, about the questions that uh, Andrea gave for us uh, about the, our workout experience, are this compatible with the degrowth message? Um, I am the same with a list that I am, uh, have not so much background on degrowth and degrowth concept is also very new in my in my country in my area, but somehow it is existing already, but it's just not recognized yet. Uh, as a part of our job, we are not just um, finding the alternative for for the energy for the the the, the people life. Uh, living peacefully and together with environment, but we also uh, struggle against the uh, mega project. Uh, it is mm, we have the river, um, Mekong River, and it's not just cross in my country, but also the neighboring country. And we try to stop the dams on the country, but we got the the questions from the neighboring countries: Why couldn't we develop? Why couldn't we uh, grow? And why couldn't we? just construct a dam for, for electric city like yours. So it is the question, why couldn't we develop? Is it hard to answer? And we somehow stuck at that controversial. Um, but I do think that with what I learned here and with what I can hear and learn and gain from you guys about the degrowth and about the growth, I uh, somehow will try to, to, to get back and to... Um, get how to say get the more clear explanation for the people to about the growth and the gr the growth grow or not growth okay. so thank you very much i would like now to open the floor for question i would like it to uh, um, to ask you to come to the microphone because of the video so first Okay. Just, okay. Just does does it work? Yes, a little bit. Low. You can briefly introduce yourself, please. Yes, my name is Françoise Golin. I live uh, five miles, for five miles north of uh, Cat. So I will make first a, a, a personal. We've not met before this conference. <laughs> I will make a. a comment as a local to, to Alice. It is not by chance that I live five miles, five kilometers from Cat. I have chosen to move there because Cat was there. But I have been very disappointed over the years because of what I call, I'm sorry, I'll be very honest, a, a technofix approach. Uh, but it is very heartening for me to hear you today and to hear that you have questions and your, your questions are genuine because I have felt for many years living near Cat that there is no at least in the older generation, possibly, there is no concept of science and technology as an inherently social practice, which I think is quite different in the peer-to-peer -peer movement. Although I have doubts, and this is my question for you, I have doubts about this because you have said in your previous presentation that a lot of people involved in peer-to-peer -peer are not into degrowth, and for instance, you gave several times the example of this wonderful motor car produced on, in a peer-to-peer -peer context. Uh, I have doubts about the possibility for a motor car or what conditions would be for a motor car to ever become a convivial technology in, this, in the sense of Ivan Illich. And I'm referring also to this article by André Gors, The Social Ideology of the Motor Car, that you can find on the internet. So I'm, I'm, I have a bit of disquiet about that. The, the key question is the key question in the peer-to-peer -peer circles of what technology do we produce, even on an alternative basis, how, how is it addressed? And... Uh, my comment to you, I'm, I'm very sorry, I don't feel I can pronounce your name <laughs> properly. Uh, and I thought this was very heartening in relation to what I've said to the two other speakers, 
that uh, for young organization to, um, to engage into an evaluation of the technologies through participatory uh, uh, methods. For instance, if you choose to use a mobile phone, what do you gain, but what do you lose, and so on. So that was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, do we want to respond immediately, or do we want to collect some questions? Let's, let's question. Okay, let's take another question. Yeah, there was another one. Okay, you and then you. Please come and maybe build a line because I'm not seeing, I don't want to <laughs> oversee every, uh, anybody. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm a PhD student working on digital commons uh, which are developed by grassroots uh, for uh, sustainability transition. So I'm very uh, interested in, in your different approaches. The first thing I I, I very like the, the idea of having this scenario of zero carbon Britain, but this doesn't bring us much further. Um, yes, we know this is possible. The technology is there, but you have to ask the question, who owns the technology, who owns the intellectual property behind it? Uh, and, then, and then very quickly, even if you talk just about the technology, not about the social change and, and, and everything, it becomes impossible. So I would strongly encourage you uh, to look at what uh, Michel Bowens and, and the whole community of peer production is doing in this direction in building new uh, sorts of uh, technology which, is, which are owned by the communities and from the very beginning which are designed for the communities. Because it's a very big problem, now we have technologies which are designed for capital. Um, and I would react on your, um, on your comment. I think this is very, uh, a very good comment uh, your car example is awful for this uh, place. I, I really understand what you're trying to make, your, your point. But this is a really awful uh, example. You are going to um, drive people away from, from your ideas in this degrowth community if you take the example of a car. Uh, I got the point, yeah? But maybe people then move away from, from this. So you have to find another example of, I don't know, uh, the open source ecology project, you could use uh, some example there of, of machines to, uh, to, buy, uh, to build uh, uh, stuff from the ground. Then my question is, how do you get involved in this uh, flock uh, uh, project? What is coming after? Um, and did you get paid in the end uh, by the Ecuador government for your work? <coughs> One more, maybe. Hello, Charlotte Knips. I'm working as a philosopher of sustain, sustainable research and development at the Fraunhofer Umsicht Institute for Environmental Technologies in Oberhausen. Um, I have just one short question or remark to um, Alice. Um, actually, when you say that uh, the biomass production is, uh, is, is carbon is uh, neutral, um, I'm not. Sh I think when you s when you hear statements like that, I'm I'm always really critical because sometimes the calculation is not done uh, on the whole frame. Because when you when it's a large scale industrial production, you also have to take into account the fertilizers and the machines and everything. So with statements like on efficient also efficiency of electric cars, you really have to if you do efficiency calculations, you really have to take all the system, like how, what's the system of, with which efficiency, efficiency the electricity is produced, how are the batteries in the cars, and I think um, for those statements, I'm sort of critical, and I'd like to know more about the, how you uh, did your, the calculations. Thanks. Thank you very much. We stop the first round and then give you the possibility. Um, first, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's actually worse than you think because Wikispeed was actually a racing car. <laughs> uh, so it's really not uh, what we're looking for. Uh, but actually, it's, you know, I, uh, it depends who you talk to. You know, this is a degrowth conference. Maybe I should have chosen another example. But if I, you know, I talk to a lot of generic, uh, general audiences and, you know, parishes and business school students. And the reason I choose the Wikispeed car is because it's a car. You know, it is the emblematic object of the industrial society and so I think it's actually a very powerful argument to use an example where this object that is like you know the thing from the industrial society is being done totally differently uh, in a different way um, now I think that the key idea that I would like to defend is, is not to look at Wikispeed as an isolated example 
but to see how we can combine things, you know, if we have a sustainability or a degrowth point of view. So think about combining these open designs, which are not proprietary. You can make tractors with it, you can make all kinds of things with it that are necessary in a community. Think of combining that, for example, with a car sharing uh, approach, right? With car sharing, uh, we save 80% of materials and energy for the same amount of kilometers. But the social logic of sharing leads to 30% less driving. Uh, so you combine already a open source car that you can locally produce in a micro factory by a local community with car sharing. And then you put on top of that a cooperative that doesn't need to accumulate capital but has a solidarity economic point of view. So that's the kind of idea that I think we have to have. We have to see that in a kind of integrative point of view. Um, but technology is going to be vital um, anyway. You know, we even, um, I mean, what makes us human is technology from the, you know, the, the spear and the bow. So that's the real question. What kind of technology do we need uh, if you want to change? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to sort of try and deal with the first couple of comments just together because I think they're probably reinforcing each other. Um, so it's about it was about sort of um, the kinds of technologies that I was talking about in the scenario and the fact that they're very dependent on capital and that it's not a very community orientated project and and that kind of thing. Um, so I think somebody said yesterday in in a different discussion on degrowth technologies that. Like the so the thing that's quite a strength I think of the project is that we already have all of the technology right. We really need to do this now. So I'm not sure about the question of waiting for new technologies to be to be put together that are different that are not based on capital because all of the technologies that we have now are based on on capital on a capitalist model because that's the system in which they were made right, which is a problem. Um, I think the only thing that I really want to say aside from that is that you know this is. This is an interesting project, and it, 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 when it started, it came out probably as a reaction at CAT from being dismissed by a lot of people in the, in the UK. Because, do you know the term yogurt weaving hippies? You know, so it's like, oh, you're so left wing and you're so off the edge of uh, the entirety of society that we don't even listen to what you're saying because, you know, you obviously have crazy, stupid ideas and, you know, we'll, we'll, never, we'll never do that. So it, it tried to become more mainstream which is why we've ended up with a scenario that's like this. And to a certain degree, it's successful. Like, we are being listened to more by people. And just the fact that people know that things like renewable technologies work is helpful, even if it's not a scenario that would happen in the future, right? Just having faith that when somebody tells them that, oh, we can't possibly go on to renewables because they don't provide a, a good energy supply for us, if they have something to back up an argument that a renewable technology is worth, you know, worth using, then that's, that's a positive, right? That's a move in the right direction. Um, and on to a technical question. So the question about biomass and carbon neutrality. Uh, I've lost the person. Where is she? Oh, in the middle. Okay. Um, so the question about biomass and carbon neutrality. Are you talking about... Um, so it's kind of weird because it's an entire system, right? So the fertilizer input... The land that we use for growing biomass is currently fertilized in the UK. So it's taken into account in the, the, the emissions that are used that are on that land currently. So it's, it's kind of allotted to a different part of the scenario, but it's still in there, right? We have some like weird re residual emissions that I haven't spoken about because they're multifaceted and a bit weird. Um, so it is counted in terms, of, in terms of that. In terms of the energy and the machinery that we use, etc. That's in the energy part of the model. So again, it's just that we kind of draw our circles slightly differently. And if we have an energy system that's carbon neutral, then actually, to a certain extent, it, it doesn't matter how much energy we use. So we could have more farm machinery to grow biomass, and, and that would be OK as long as we've got the fuel for it, right, that's carbon neutral. Um, in terms of cars and the efficiency, I'm not sure I really understood the question about dependence on your energy production. So perhaps we could just talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, in terms of, I mean, again, a lot of it is to do with sort of the system. So it's where we draw those circles. Um, so for example, um, <clears throat> well, I guess in terms of like the efficiency, then we make assumptions that are like, uh, 
we look at current literature and we look at things that have been proven to work. So the efficiency rating that we take for cars, for example, is from the literature. It's from somebody going, I have made this car. It has this efficiency attached to it. So I could try and look up some papers for you. I don't have the detail now. Well, thank you very much. Chan told me she doesn't have any comment for now. So we just open this second round of questions. Hi, I'm Nicola. I'm a computer scientist, and uh, so I had actually so Alice, you were looking for tension points between the ideas in degrowth and what you presented. So maybe I can help there and point and uh, point out one thing. Um, so um, you described your model and you say it was basically uh, in the idea of a steady state thing. Right? So uh, there's one. I mean one important idea, I guess, in the, in the whole discourse of degrowth would be this uh, uh, decolonization of, of the imaginary, of, of your fantasies. And interestingly enough, there was, in one of your pictures, for uh, like what it could look like, there was this, well, this twist of London or wherever in, in the UK, and uh, a Gap store, <laughs> which was an interesting example. And so, of course, then the point is, uh, these guys at Gap probably won't be very happy if you say that the whole model works if it's a steady state economy, so they can't grow anymore. So uh, is there a way maybe of looking uh, at things the way your model does, but that would be kind of more dynamic in the sense that you could uh, update this uh, as, as in, in terms of uh, the, the, more, the more you grow, what's going to happen on the side of what you're going to have to do to make this model work. So can this model kind of be made uh, parameterized by how, how much people want to grow? And then we would actually see what kind of craziness we have to go to to balance for the growth that would be obtained if we actually don't change anything to the general system. Thanks. Another question? OK, yes, please come. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I went to this um, session because I'm interested in the technology. Uh, for my background, I'm a teacher here in the University of Leipzig and um, I'm teaching teachers. So um, there's the question of how to uh, uh, educate young people in sustainable development, stuff like that. Uh, in July, we had a group from Tanzania here uh, as guests in Leipzig and uh, we had a big discussion about renewable energies and my sentence was well wind, sun, we have it everywhere, every time but the answer was but we don't have the technology to use this energy so my uh, question to you would be uh, uh, what is the answer for example for local communities in Tanzania How? just one example so how they can use it so the example from Vietnam, it was somehow um, positive, but uh, what is maybe the answer in the peer-to-peer -peer project? And also maybe in the um, zero carbon Britain stuff, because maybe there are also some scenarios for the developing countries. Thank you. Is there one more question? Yeah, please come. <laughs> Hello, my name is Benjamin, and I have also some questions to both of you. One, uh, Alice, uh, you talked about lots of efficiency strategies and how much more efficient we could do things. Do you also thought about uh, the rebound effect of all these efficient efficiency strategies, and did you keep that anyhow in mind? And my second question is to Michael. Um, with your peer-to-peer -peer, um, strategies and technologies, do you think there is a possibility to uh, also create on this level high-tech technology like computers and also the parts of computers like microchips and, and that? Yeah. Thank you. So I give you now the word. Um. Okay, well, the, the first thing maybe I can say is that um, I think it's really wrong to say that all technologies today are produced by capital. <laughs> uh, I think there is more and more technologies that are produced outside of capital. 
Uh, for example, if you look for a car, and I'm sorry to use a Wikispeed example, but it it is five times as fuel efficient as any car from Detroit. Uh, and all the open source cars, there are 26 of them, uh, are have a sustainability aspect, simply because they are made by communities for use value. They have a different logic of development than a corporate R&D, which has to protect market scarcity. So I would look, uh, you know, if I was the, what's it called, the cats, I would certainly look at this emerging field of open technologies because they're there and, and more and more technologies are being developed like that. Because if you're a young person today, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to get some friends together, some brains, computers, networks, and to just design and to worry about capital later. Uh, so in other words, there, there is a real movement because of our social condition today of more and more young people when they start today, not the legacy systems, but the new companies like in, in hardware, they're, they're very often in more and more open hardware companies where they're based on these open communities and based on shareable knowledge. Um, what was the other question? Um, yeah, oh yes, for the industrial part, well, you know, there's still a lot of difficulties and I'm not a technician, so uh, we have issues, for example, that indeed, you know, the, the, the really basic machinery is patented. Uh, so Arduino, uh, you know, I'm not an expert, but they can only do certain things around the proprietary uh, technology. They cannot really go to the heart of it. Uh, and there is still no good solution for sharing patents in an open way. So. You can share the designs, but you cannot share uh, processes or something. I'm not sure. I, mean, I would have to ask an expert. So there's still a lot of obstacles. Um, but I think the good thing to remember, this is a social movement, and it wants to get there. And it's trying worldwide to solve these obstacles. And this is not like, you know, silver bullet approach I'm doing here. This is a real continuous effort of many people throughout the world to solve these obstacles to having really shared knowledge and to having an industrial system based on distributed manufacturing, distributed financing. Um, but here's the problem. Most of the people in the sharing, what we call the sharing economy, when they want to do business, they think startups. On the other hand, we have cooperatives, we have the solidarity economy. And they're not thinking open. They're usually, like Mondragon, still using closed uh, intellectual property. So, and this is a huge political task. It's finding synergy and mutual enrichment of solidarity economy, cooperative world with the open world. And the same thing with green. Uh, you know, there's at the fringes of the open uh, movement, there are more and more green labs, open sustainability, uh, but nowhere where we need to be. So there's also, I think, a synergy to be solved between the green, large, you know, largely interpreted, and the open. So I think this is what we need to do now, is finding synergies between these families that do not sufficiently look at each other at present. Um, um, in terms of the question of the teacher, teacher, um, I want to share a bit more about my uh, project in Vietnam. That's um, uh, in terms of the uh, promoting uh, renewable energy technology for the local people. Uh, at first, they also have no idea what is the energy, what is the net technique. They don't have the technical background or knowledge. But uh, in our project, we have the training and also the raising awareness event and get the people together and to with the simple words to get them to know step by step about the, the technology and about the, the renewable energy. It's not always about the solar or um, a particular resource, but it is about the utilizing their local resource, what they have. It could be about the solar, it could be biogas, biomass, uh, also about uh, um, for example, in uh, a village, we have uh, implemented the project. They are the, um, the main livelihood of them is rice cultivation, and they always burn straw in the field after harvesting. So we try to help them to have the improved cook stuff and to utilize what the, the waste from the agricultural. 
and it is about also about the renewable energy. So I think um, it is important to get the people involved in um, the process of applying and to know about uh, the the technical um, models as well, because when they know that, they will support it and also be active in in applying and in uh, conservating that model. I just want to briefly mention it because I didn't mention it in my presentation about the participatory aspects of the experience in Ecuador. Um, so the first thing we did was 24 seminars in the provinces, uh, mainly geared at local, urban and rural people, uh, women's movements, youth movements, um, neighborhood associations, these kind of things, uh, using um, theater of the oppressed uh, as a means of uh, conveying the open ideas and see how people would react to it. And one of the things that was a bit of problematic was that indigenous people, because of biopiracy, actually favor at present traditional intellectual property. So that was one interesting issue. Um, the second phase was very intensive consultation with civic society. So we had um, uh, 70 or more consultations with NGOs and civic organizations. Uh, so on basis of that, we produced a synthesis, which was then put online uh, using an open source uh, um, software called Comment, which is a bit like Google Doc in a way, but it's uh, open source, which allowed people to go into the very detail of these policy papers um, to, you know, to make remarks and to offer changes. Then the final uh, process of participation was we had a summit and we had 12 tables we had uh, f foreign experts that we invited, we had local people, and uh, we had the government. So we had like a three-parted three uh, structure for the tables. Um, so, you know, by no means perfect and by no means everything worked as we wanted it to work, but still there was a, I just want to stress that there was, you know, a, a strong participatory pro process attached to the formulation of the, of the proposals. Uh, and I'm just going to try and use what the two other speakers have just said about participation to deal with the question on rebound effect. Uh, where's the person? Sorry, at the back. Um, so we, we don't implicitly have the rebound effect. There aren't people in here. We're literally taking numbers and decreasing them by what various papers and other people and people doing research suggest we can. Um, so there's no behavior element. Um, so, and I think the key is in how. You know, the rebound effect probably stems from actually not really understanding what's going on in the scenario and what, or in the situation and not having your aim in the right direction, right? So, uh, okay, so I, I use the, 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 let's flip this on its head, right? If we were to use a participatory, potentially let's, let's try like a community energy scheme, right? So the evidence suggests that actually the rebound goes, it's not a rebound effect, it's an accentuation, right? So if you're involved in a community energy scheme and you're participating in designing your own system, then actually it has positive effects. So you also decrease your energy use. So it can, I, I think the method tells you whether or not you have to deal with a rebound effect or you have like a, a reinforcing loop. And we don't say the how, so. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, there was a brief question on whether I know of any scenarios for developing countries. Where's that person? Hello. Um, I don't know of any. Um, it's probably also worth stating that there aren't very many scenarios that go this far, full stop. You know, I think I know of a handful. And some of them only deal with energy. So, you know, we have industrial emissions and we have agricultural emissions on top of energy. And a lot of scenarios don't look at those at all. So... You know, there are many steps for westernized countries to, to do first, I guess. I feel like that. Not that it's any less important, but, um, yeah, a lacking there. <laughs> um, we're trying to be quite open about our methodology to encourage others to develop scenarios that suit them. And we did have someone who was trying to do zero carbon Egypt, but actually the political situation there was not helpful to her. Um, <laughs> so she, it, the project folded. She didn't get anywhere, unfortunately. Um, and in terms of being able to push our model to see what happens if we grow, 
where's that person? Sorry. Um, it is possible. It, because we don't have an economy in our model as such, then we don't have like a slider that we can go like grow, degrow. I think the only way that we could possibly do it is to kind of go backwards through what I very briefly tried to do in terms of looking at our assumptions and then pick apart which ones we would have effects on the model that would need to change. And then we, we could try and, and do it that way. Um, one, so I guess it would be interesting because actually it would very, very quickly become inc incredibly impossible or um, unacceptable. Um, one thing we do as a project is actually we have a, an energy game and basically we lead we have a map and we have squares that represent how big wind farms are or solar farms or like how much area you need for biomass and we say this is the energy that we use in the UK you know you try and make it and people map it out and they don't like the way the landscape looks <laughs> sometimes they just choose to annex part of the UK and go we will cut off that area of the country and just completely dominate it with industry it's really interesting um, but most people then go I don't like the way that that looks how about we just use less energy? Can we do that? So they, they kind of go through the process themselves and it's very natural. And I think if you, if you see the struggle that we have to provide the amount of energy that we have at the moment, for example, if you were to grow it, then I think that potentially would be a very, very powerful tool to, to uh, help people understand that that is potentially not a future that they want, actually, you know? Um, so maybe I will have a think about that. So, thank you very much. Are there more questions? More points? Yes, please come. I'm, I'm Thomas from Switzerland, and I, <coughs> um, I have taught ethics uh, in a teacher training university. I have two small questions. The first to Michel. Um, I have heard or read that it is also possible to construct weapons, guns, with uh, the, mo uh, the same modular uh, way you have explained uh, in the exa example of cars. Um, so uh, there is, uh, this means that there is open access to weapons. And so I would be interested in, in knowing um, how do you deal with this um, uh, problem. And I've got a completely different question to Nguyen uh, to Trang. Uh, yeah. Um, um, you, you did not, 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 not tell us uh, how many villages and so on you are uh, um, working with and whether the, um, the energy uh, um, is all already used and uh, you, you, um, you um, uh, substitute uh, all, uh, energy already used by renew renewable energy or whether you introduce the use of energy in these villages. Mm -hmm. I'm often in, I, I, I t I'm teaching also ethics in Mozambique, in one of the uh, poorest countries, and um, I, I'm all, <laughs> I learned there that I better do not um, speak on ecological questions. Uh, actually, they say that's the, the problem of you, of the industrialized countries of the north, we have to de develop first. Uh, we have to combat misery, and they are right. So my uh, question is: How do you motivate um, uh, people to use renewable renewable energies and not <laughs> and 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 fight against building dams? I know that th this is a, a problem all over. Uh, the southern hemisphere, um, but how do you do that, and uh, how how do you <laughs> con uh, convince people that this is not only a problem of the nor northern hemisphere? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? Okay. My name is Klaus Pritzer from BU and the Environmental Organization, and my question to you three is. Um, your opinion, what will be the main drivers for your issues in the future? You tell us time is running. 
and will it be limit of resources, for example, information, techn technological change, or other is issues? What do you think, what are the drivers we must emphasize? Is there another question? Please come at the front. Hi, I'm Emma, I'm from the UK. Thank you very much for your presentations, they were very interesting. A uh, question for Alice, um, a quite specific one about uh, solar panels. As I understand, they require quite a lot of metals and sort of rare metals, and where would we get them from? And if it's from <laughs> other countries, then are we not potentially compromising their ability to be completely sufficient? But I very much enjoyed your frankness about what the assumptions were, and it's very refreshing to see so many numbers and models in considering that. So, thank you. So, we have uh, 12 more minutes, so we <coughs> will uh, see if we get other questions. So, please go on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, I'll just be brief. Um, with the solar panels, I'm sorry, you've just gone no, over there, sorry. Um, uh, so, uh, ha taking work of others, right, so looking at sort of a, a globally, if everybody had this standard of living in ZTB, how much, you know, how many solar panels we would need, we'd probably put them in better places in the UK, but um, then we do have enough resources. And actually, interestingly, from people who look at you know, rare metals, um, the kinds of things that we need to use in renewables. The problem is not necessarily those small things. I mean, they're in very difficult, potentially for us anyway, difficult places to get to. Um, but the problem is actually in the, the sheer amount of things like concrete. <laughs> you know, it's like the big stuff is, is really the issue. Um, and, and, you know, like I say, the, the estimates are that there is enough material to go around, but it does require more extraction than we have currently. Um, so the politics of the situation, I think, is, you know, uh, I don't have an answer for that. So where would we buy it or where would we get it from and how would that happen? And I think that is more of an issue than whether or not we have enough. Um, that's it. Um, yeah, about the question I got from that man um, about um, uh, our project, we have now four commons uh, project implemented in four commons in the uh, Red uh, River Delta in Vietnam. It is in from the north, one in the central in the Vietnam, and uh, moving for another one with the very first step project in the uh, south of Vietnam. It is in the uh, Mekong River Delta. And uh, about how to get people, how to motivate people to use more renewable energy, I could say that is still about raising awareness. Uh, with the project, we have the event, we have the training, we have the people to involve in, and it is also about what the benefit they get from this. For example, well, uh, we got the interview with one man. It is the old man. And he said that it's so great since they have the biogas system in their house because they can uh, save a uh, amount of money buying gas or also electricity um, because now they have biogas and they don't have to buy any gas for cooking anymore. So it is the important thing that they can see by themselves the benefit they can get from the renewable energy. And it's also um, help them to get rid of the smell of the pigs release. So it is the thing that I, I, I just want to focus that the people can see themselves the benefit and why they need that. It is not about we talk about them that you have to do something, but it is about them to do them something by themselves and get the, 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 um, the acknowledgement, get the awareness. Um, about the dams, it is uh, more easier because the the impact on the people life is very easy to to be seen uh, for example um, we we have a lot of people and uh, indigenous community living along the rivers 
and definitely their life being impacted by the dams. So uh, what we can do for them is get their voice to the other people, get their stories and also involving the media to get the broader uh, attention from the public city. And we also do the research to show the evidence to the decision maker to convince them that is not good and it's not about just uh, developing, it is also about the human being, the human life. Um, yes, the difficult question of the open source guns. How are we going to answer that one? <laughs> um, well, I think we, we can distinguish two levels. Um, so I consider commons-based peer production so uh, as a system uh, which is at, at the moment like a proto-mode of production. So it's not fully social reproducible, but it's, you can see that it's, it's, it's going into the, in that direction. So we kind of have a moment in history, like at the end of the Roman Empire or the end of the feudal system, where we see something new emerging and we see more and more patterns in different directions. And we can also see more and more patterns finding each other and, and kind of foresee how this is producing a new logic. And that new logic has a certain basic ethics, which is producing a commons, etc., which is very different from the you know, logic of producing a commodity, right? Now, if you produce a commodity, which is the core logic of capitalism, you can still make, uh, you know, weapons of destruction, or you can, uh, you know, I don't know, have a massage cooperative. It's both a commodity, but it's very different, right? So I guess that's the the answer, is that within the peer production kind of emergence, there are libertarian people who do not believe in the public monopoly of violence. And so in, within their ethics, they think they should have the freedom to make guns. I don't agree with that uh, particular uh, interpretation, uh, but that's where it comes from. These people have a particular political philosophy, you know, where they're against the monopoly of violence. And, you know, it's also contextual. Maybe one day we'll be happy that we have open source guns because we live in a failed state and we have fascist thugs on the other side. So who knows, right? Uh, just anticipating a potential scenario. Uh, <laughs> Um, so that's the answer to that one. Um, and, you know, for me, it's like, you know, we have a telephone and, you know, I'm in love, I'm going to talk to my wife, but then the mafia is going to use the telephone to do something entirely different. It's not really about the telephone, it's about, you know, the contextual uh, ideology of these people who use it. Um, drivers, yeah, that's also quite a complex question. Um, so I'm one of those people who believe that capitalism is already dead in a way, right? It's kind of uh, uh, on its last legs. Just uh, I'll give two arguments from the opposite sides. So Wallerstein, Emmanuel Wallerstein has um, one of the basic argument is that every factor of production, uh, g the price goes up. So whether we talk about energy or materials, labor or taxation, even though it's a wave and it goes down sometimes, over time, on the input side of capitalism, things get more and more expensive and therefore profit making is more and more uh, handicapped. On the other side, the output side, I will use the argument of uh, Jeremy Rifkin, where he says more and more activities becomes commons produced and destroy the commodity uh, aspect. So we have, once you have distributed energy, you have, yes, you have a huge investment in the beginning, but then afterwards, you know, you have a much lower marginal cost of production of, en of distributed energy, and it destroys the commodity form, eventually destroys the commodity form of energy, and it becomes a commons, right? Um, with all the ecological issues. And so for me, the question is, and, and the way I work with it is, uh, two scenarios, well I have four scenarios but I simplify them in two scenarios and I call it the low road and the high road, right? So think the end of the Roman Empire, that was pretty much a low road, right? Uh, total destruction of the civilization, no more roads, no more cities, no more, uh, no more uh, anything basically. <laughs> they can't even find ceramics, you know, from the 5th to the 10th century. So conceivably, you know, in the dark collapse scenarios, we could have scenario where peer-to-peer -peer is driven by survivalists, 
lifeboat strategies. And this is already happening. You know, if you look at in Spain, for example, or in Greece, you know, the solidarity uh, initiatives, social pharmacies, social clinics, uh, they're not driven by idealism. They are driven by very basic survival needs. You know, you look at Madrid, Barcelona, there are literally thousands of new co-ops uh, being formed in a year. Uh, the number of time banks, uh, time banks exploded from A to 400 in two years. Uh, this is driven by need. Um, so in this scenario, the kind of picture that Alice showed is not going to be possible. It's going to be, uh, you know, the Roman Empire scenario on a very uh, basic level uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer technologies will be used. The optimistic scenario um, is that we develop sufficient social, economic, and political power to introduce peer-to-peer -peer on the basis of civic infrastructures, of rich, basic civic infrastructures. This means that we have to succeed, and time is of the essence, like there, within 10, 15 years to rebuild the social movements no longer around labor, which is declining, but around the commons. So we have a huge political project of finding synergies between social movement, that's my point of view, between the degrowth movements, the solidarity economic movements, the sharing movements, the peer-to-peer -peer movements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, to try to find and build uh, uh, social political movements that can fight against austerity uh, and create a really healthy social basis uh, for a thriving peer-to-peer -peer society instead of a survivalist peer-to-peer -peer society. Okay, thank you very much. The time is almost finished. Are there uh, some very brief and urgent questions? Or uh, maybe you, yes, you can comment. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted, sorry, this was quite rude, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> It, it was because the, the question about drivers, I think, was open to the three of us. And I kind of just, it was interesting listening to you talk, actually, because I think I was, from perhaps a different slant, going to say pretty much the same thing. So, I, you know, my I would say the driver is climate, because that's what I've been looking at. But it's a similar situation, right? And it's what Naomi Klein was actually saying at the beginning. It's change or change. We don't have a business as usual future. It is not open to us. It is not an option. Um, either we change the way that we do things out of choice and try and create something different that we hope is positive, or we have change imposed upon us. And be that breakdown because of the breakdown of a capitalist society, or be that a breakdown because uh, of the, the impact of climate change. It's the same, right? So we, I, I would prefer the first, like let's choose to change, right? And, and make things better rather than deal with a crisis situation. But I think, I think climate really has a big important driver and I think it's, it's difficult to tell one driver because I think they're so interlinked. Are there final comments? I think we are all hungry maybe. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much.